Good morning, all. I'm here with Roger Gutz. It's evening time for him. Uh, welcome to the fourth in a series of AGIF sustainability webinars. In the coming months, every week, we will continue to deliver webinars on turf and club management with industry leaders to supply career building information to professionals in Asia. The Asian Golf Industry Federation is a not-for-profit membership federation comprising of suppliers and facilities in the turf, club, and sports industry. The Federation focuses on building sustainable practices, both in environmental and economic aspects throughout the Asia Pacific region. We strongly believe that the key in development of sustainable industry is the education and empowerment of professionals in the industry, hence the webinars like this one. We've developed the AGIF Certificate in Greenskeeping, which is supported by the RNA and uh, five AGIF member organizations. The CIG focuses on developing the skill set of greenkeepers, turf professionals throughout Asia. We also focus on club management education and are the partner of the Club Management Association of America. We have rolled out education in Asia for the pathway to the certified club manager degree. The CCM is considered the gold standard in club management industry globally and managers in Asia now can achieve the necessary education here in Asia as a result of this partnership with the CMAA. It is vital to have strong partnerships in implementing education throughout Asia, and our education is recognized for credits from the PGA of America, the PGA of GBN Ireland, the PGA of Australia, the PGA of Japan, the Club Management Association of America, and the GCSAA. Due to the travel restrictions from COVID-19 pandemic, webinars are the only way that we can continue to deliver education at the moment. We'll resume event education when travel restrictions ease and we'll keep you posted as this develops. Over the last few months, we've spent a lot of time improving our digital offering and membership benefits. For more information, please log on to www.agif.asia, as well as our LinkedIn and Facebook company pages. Please also sign up for our weekly newsletter to join the 10,000 industry contacts and in receiving a weekly industry update. Lastly, the AGIF is a not-for-profit federation, and now more than ever, we rely upon membership dues to operate. So if you like what we do, and or if you think that your facility or company will benefit from communicating with the industry, please note that our membership benefits are substantial and can be seen on our, our website under AGIF Membership Benefits. Please take a look. And if you're already an AGIF member, thank you so much. Your ongoing support is greatly appreciated. On that topic, we'd like to thank the sponsors for today's webinars. Without their support, we will not be able to run these events. They are Syngenta and the Toro Company. Both companies are founding members of the AGIF and strong supporters of industry education, as well as all of our other activities. On to some housekeeping issues. Roger will present on the topic for roughly 60 minutes, and we'll still have 50, 30 minutes for a Q&A after that. The chat buttons are on throughout, so please feel free to ask questions, and then we can voice to Roger during that session. Now on to the main event and to introduce our speaker today, Roger Gutz, uh, CGCS. Current position is Director of Golf Course Maintenance at Koto de Casa Golf and Racquet Club, 36 holes private country club with POA bent grass greens, Bandera 419 Bermuda grass fairways and roughs, and rye grass over seeded fairways. Roger's previous positions have included superintendent at Shankin Bay Golf Club in Hainan Island in China. That's a private 18 hole top 100 in the World Golf Club with Sea Isle Supreme Paspalum Greens, Tees, and Fairways. He's also at the director of golf course maintenance at Barton Creek Resort and Spa in Austin, Texas, 72 hole private country club, number one golf resort in the state of Texas, Mini Verde, Tifiga, Bermuda, Grass Greens, 419 Tees, and Fairways. He's also the director of agronomy at Redstone Golf Club in Humble, Texas, 36 hole private country club, Tiff Eagle, Mini Verde, Greens, Tiff Sport Fairways, and home of the Shell Houston Open. Director of golf course maintenance at Black Horse Golf Club in Cypress, Texas, daily fee 36 hole, Tiff Eagle Greens, and 419 Fairways. Roger also worked in Thailand, Indonesia, and India as construction superintendent on projects in these countries in the past. And in his recent stay in China, Roger assisted the AGF many times in delivering fantastic turf grass and club management education for our events in the Philippines, Taiwan, and Indonesia. Roger, welcome. Well, thank you very much. 
Eric, thanks for that introduction. Uh, you didn't have to say all that, but anyway. <laughs> thanks for the uh, introduction and thanks for the Asian Golf Industry Federation, as well as all board members who are allowing me to present some information. Um, Eric has been relentless in the pursuit to help golf course superintendents in the region gain more knowledge and improve themselves as well. And uh, can't, can't thank you enough. Uh, and thanks to the sponsors uh, who continue to support the industry and superintendents worldwide. So I'm gonna start uh, sharing my screen and get into this topic so we can get, get started. Okay, so for those of you out there that may have listened to Dr. Rock's Gusan's talk a couple weeks ago, I want to recap a couple things. He provided a lot of data in which to formulate a cultural practice program that best fits your needs with the resources you have, uh, with the goal to minimize your thatch layers and improve your overall turf health. My recommendation here, uh, do my recommendations here parallel Dr. Rock's findings, and I can confirm that in my program, I will be highlighting similar practices which I incorporate for success. For those of you that are interested, you can view Dr. Rock's talk through the Asian Golf Industry website if you haven't already viewed it. Um, but uh, it shares a lot of data and, it's, and a lot of good stuff there. In summary, he concluded that managing thatch could be performed with top dressing sand in conjunction with solid tines or coring tines, and that both produce positive similar results. But the primary number one reduction of thatch would come from frequently adding USGA sand to the greens profile in conjunction with different cultivation techniques. Without top dressing sand, reducing thatch will not be successful at all. I can confirm that top dressing sand is the most critical component to managing your thatch biomass and mat layers. Dr. Rock and industry professionals refer to this top profile as the mat layer. Knowing how to manage this mat layer is the challenge for each of us. I've been truly fortunate in my career to have been able to work in several Asian countries, as, as Eric said, and with different grasses. Also working with the PGA Tour a few years ago gave me great insight and experience on what it takes to successfully host a PGA event that tour players were extremely excited to play and very happy with the condition of the greens. Not only have I seen challenges that superintendents face, but have experienced them firsthand, obviously. I've also helped a lot of others in, on a consultant basis, uh, working with them to improve their culture practices and overall programs as well. I understand that there are probably hundreds of different ways to manage thatch, biomass, mat layers out there in the world. But what I would wanna share with you today is, is basically proven, I've used it over and over, and I wanna help you understand some of my, my key, key uh, components to this. At Cota de Casa, where we have 36 holes and close to 900 very active golfing members, the pressure to return the courses to play after aeration has been and remains very high. In the past, only three days was given to perform greens aeration per golf course, because of the demand for keeping the courses open for play. The program that I will be discussing typically requires a few more days to complete. I did not want to open the golf course greens until they were reasonably recovered from the aeration and top dressing process. Therefore, I took extra time to explain the importance and benefits to the type of program that would improve the conditions of the greens. And now, instead of three days, we have seven and eight days. With proper communications with management and membership associations, I now can perform this important task to a much higher standard than before. The members now have embraced the changes and due to improved conditioning on the, our greens, everyone is pleased. So the communication is everything. So the definition of thatch, uh, as you can read there, uh, under, under 
attaches the undecomposed or partially decomposed layer of living dead grass stems, roots, rhizomes, stolons, and other organic matter that is found between the soil surface and the grass blades. If that gets out of hand, you will have everything below, you know, soft, mushy, disease prone, all, blah, 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 all the problems that, that, that you see there, uh, prone to mower scalping, uh, LDS, and everything. And Dr. Rock mentioned all of these things. So uh, this isn't something that you want. In greens management, to me, the key to success is managing the thatch layer, not only healthy, but also one that promotes a quality putting service all the time. Balancing this concept uh, is your challenge. Most people say three eighths to a half inch thatch layer is optimum, uh, but that depends on your, your desires and cultural practices. I've found that the smaller the thatch layer, the firmer the surface and the smoother the ball rolls. As organic matter accumulates, biomass increases over time. The root zone becomes less well aerated. Organic matter decomposition slows with decreased oxygen levels. This leads to an increase in moisture being held at the mat layer, but a decrease in drainage coefficient, which makes it more vulnerable to many other issues, thus begins the downward spiral in which turf cover is lost. Okay, thatch, biomass, and black layer. These terms are synonymous, in my opinion, to go hand in hand when talking about greens management programs. If you have excessive thatch, and biomass, then you can predict that black layer is likely to be present in some, in some form as well. So if you have profiles that look anything like these two photos, then you more, more than likely don't have quality putting services either and need to consider doing things differently than you have done you know, in the past. Black layer is something that should be, never be allowed to exist as it is a clear indication that serious problems do exist and that it, and, and if nothing is done, you will be looking at an expensive renovation in the future. Black layer is a complete result of a lack of oxygen in the root zone, promoting anaerobic bacterial conditions. This is the opposite of what you want. And, and let, me just, let me just pause here and, and sort of get on a soapbox a little bit. I might add to this problem, I see this more often. You know, I believe that one of the biggest challenges that superintendents face in the market now, nowadays is with upper management, general managers, owners, club pros, and the likes. And I often find that when I come to a, when it comes to greens aeration, superintendents don't always have any say, and they don't get the time to, to complete the job correctly, and all too often are not allowed to perform this function to the extent that they would like to. And superintendents are forced to make compromises in that and that affects the overall quality of the work. They often use a smaller aeration time at a larger spacing that allows the green to recover quicker and in the end sacrificing quality in the process. The pressure from membership or golfers play a big role in the program as well. Without prior uh, communication to everyone, a sound agronomic program can be a PR nightmare for the superintendent and trust between the superintendent and management often takes months to rectify as a result. I realize that all of this usually due to the financial aspects, aspects of a club. However, the responsibility on your program lies with you, the superintendent, to sit down with management to clearly inform them of the materials and methods you plan to utilize to ensure that the work you plan to perform is not only warranted, but needed. I hope that in some information that I, I share today will help you communicate that need without any restriction whatsoever. So if you've got this kind of plug in your greens, then I strongly recommend that uh, you need some, some form of better aeration. So once black layer development occurs, drainage dramatically decreases in the soil. As the, as the layer increases, the pores in the soil become filled with hydrogen sulfide gas, research found that that's lethal to turf grass, so it's not good. Um, as you can see by this slide, black layer is prevalent and aeration and top dressing sand has helped to mitigate the problem, but more needs to be done to eliminate this black layer. Obviously the problem began years ago due to the lack of sound, ag agronomic aeration, and top dressing over a long period. So what is biomass? And, you know, 
it's, a, it's kind of a buzzword in a lot of cases. It's defined as stats, organic material, and all the plant parts, both dead and alive, from the turf grass surface to the root zone. The amount of which biomass stats accumulates depends on the turf grass variety, environmental factors, and cultural practice management techniques. You know, for example, zoysia, bermuda, past palum would be considered to accumulate more thatch than creeping bentgrass and other cool season varieties due to the high lignin content that they produce. Lignin is the one cell wall component that resists microbial breakdown and therefore requires what I call scheduled removal or dilution, as Dr. Rock says, when it accumulates past a certain level. As I will point out later, biomass continues to increase as time goes on, and I refer to the term thinning as a description of the aeration process. When you core aerate, you are collectively thinning the biomass by whatever time size and spacing is. The larger the time size, the smaller the spacing, the more biomass is, is impacted and removed. All turf grass types for greens develop this issue, and if they didn't, they wouldn't be considered a suitable grass for greens in the first place. So it's an ongoing challenge to keep that biomass percentage at an optimal level for superior putting conditions. So what works to control thatch? Uh, Dr. Rock has done a lot of studies um, and everything I saw there is very pertinent. And I, I brought up one that he probably is familiar with but there's a, there's a university research trial, trials conducted 50 years ago, and not 50 years ago, but in the last 50 years, a lot of cultural practices have been more effective due to this research. Advances in technology and equipment make the challenge much easier also. Uh, and so here's the, here's the study I was talking about. It's the University of Tennessee THAT study that was done. And you can see by the blue arrow, there's this is verticutting and coring uh, at 5.68 millimeters thick. And, and then the next one is verticutting and four times, uh, or four times verticutting. Next one is eight times verticutting. The one below that's verticutting and potassium. The next one is verticutting, potassium, and lime. And the next one is just potassium and so forth. Verticutting and lime, potassium and lime, core aeration by itself a check and then lime and then uh, wetting agent was the was the last one. So key cultural practice programs that will have the most impact on thatch accumulation. Number one, verticutting, core aeration, top dressing sand amendments, uh, gypsum, fertilization, organic, synthetic, foliar, and pH mowing techniques, irrigation, water quality management, wetting agents, and PGRs. But the top three I circled are verticutting, core aeration, top dressing, sand. As you can see, the best reduction of thatch in this University of Tennessee study was verticutting and coring along with top dressing. So at three times, six times the thatch depth goes from six to five to four. Um, and so these, these are confirmed that, like I said, the three main uh, cultural practices are the most effective according to this study. So let's talk about verticutting. Verticutting greens does help remove thatch and unwanted biomass and organic matter. Opens up the green surface, allowing top dressing sand to penetrate the canopy, helping to dilute the putting surface and reducing thatch near the surface. I verticut deeper prior to core aeration. Uh, helps to keep the surface better disease resistant, improves surface drainage, stimulates shoot growth, improves, improves firmness and green speed, as well as better uniformity and texture. Uh, verticutting, let's talk about verticutting versus grooming. Um, and back before, before that, I'm going to say, when you, when you take a closer look at verticutting, 
What I look for is the proper depth, the correct verticut blades. And in this case, I use carbide tips, which are better and they do, a, they, they'll actually take out a little bit more material than the thin blades do. So I use them. And then of course the spacing and the, the direction of, of verticutting. Just prior to aeration, I typically verticut two directions at 90 degrees to open up the canopy, allowing more sand to penetrate in the canopy versus going two times back and forth in the same direction. So my goal is to penetrate the mat layer, just getting into the actual green surface, but not into the rhizomes and stolons or too deep, causing serious disruption to the surface. So a little on groomers. Uh, as you can see on the, on the slide on the left, that's a typical groomer. And on the right is a, is a verticut blade. So, you know, this is, this might be a little controversial for some of you. Some of you might may be using groomers, I don't know, but I think groomers were invented by the equipment manufacturers to sell more equipment for the, for the most part. I think the concept is valid. Most of the time when you can do two jobs at the same time, it sells. People can sometimes be sold on this concept alone, but I think that first, groomers are located right in front of the mower cutting unit, and when you turn them on during mowing, they do kick up whatever particles of sand that remain in the mat layer. And in this mixture of grass, thatch, and debris, the sand will find its way into the mower blades, causing a low quality of cut and tearing the leaf blades at a much faster pace. This happens even if you typically set them down into the canopy a small fraction. So if you're like me, you often have a little bit of sand in your mat layer from frequent light top dressings, which is normal. Then, it, then that in itself is sometimes problematic when you wanna get a clean, sharp cut on your greens if you're using groomers. If you cut greens in the morning, and who doesn't, then dew is often present and sticks to that, that the sand and the material more readily than rain or irrigation water. Then this clearly reduces the quality of cut and dulls the mowers even after a few minutes of cutting. Groomers will do the same thing even if it's the surface is dry. When I, when I possibly can, I do understand and use irrigation to syringe the green to knock that, that dew off, but that helps uh, only in some cases if you're grooming. If it, it helps tremendously when you're mowing, but when you're grooming, it doesn't help as much. So it's because of this that I prefer to use a verticut units over groomers prior to aeration so that less overall work needs to be done to your greens mowers. Plus verticutters can do a much better job getting down into the mat layer and they're thicker and they can remove more thatch more efficiently than groomers can do. This is why I typically don't use groomers on my greens mowers due to this effect and I feel like it does more harm than good. So this is a verticut setup with the new carbide tip blades at a spacing of 12 millimeters. And being able to get sand into the thatch layer at approximately 12 millimeter intervals is one reason why it becomes an excellent tool to get sand into the mat layer at a much higher percentage. When going in two directions at 90 degrees, yeah, I recommend using caution with at the depth, but I over encourage the approach to increase the channels for top dressing sand. I prefer to use the carbide blades, like I said. This is um, an example of, being ver of, of the material that can be removed during verticutting before aeration. As you can see, a lot of material is coming out. And as that, after that comes out, then you wanna sweep and clean the green surface with all that debris. And I, I highly recommend this brush and a, and a greens mower. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can blow it off too. Uh, you can, use a riding mower, there's a lot of ways, but this is one very effective way that collects the, the, that collects the, the vertica clippings better than anything. So let's talk a little bit about now core aeration versus solid time, which is a little bit controversial and, and Dr. Rock pointed out a lot of good things uh, in his stuff. Uh, core aeration, has been proven to be the key option to reduce unwanted thatch and improve overall turf health. From a number standpoint, it was the highest uh, utilized aeration 
amongst the survey, the big survey that Dr. Roth did perform. And, and I confirm that coriation is the number one uh, best way to, to, to remove thatch. Larger solid tine aeration can be used. And I think only if you, it's to me, it's, if, it's an option if you only have that option. And I don't think most everybody has, has more than one option. Uh, smaller solid tines do help in, in venting greens at certain times when coloration is not possible. Without some form of aeration, excessive thatch and black layer will result, obviously. So programs vary within courses, which, which Dr. Rock confirms. Uh, without enough aeration, turf grass potential, uh, growth potential slows over time. Um, in discussing you know, solid tine aeration versus hollow coring aeration. I'd like to point out a couple things um, that I think are important. When using a 10 to 12 millimeter solid tine in your greens, you're pushing the solid tine into the surface of the green and displacing the surface, shattering small roots that you can't see, but there's, you're shattering the roots within the area. And depending on the spacing and the, so and the tine size, I think you're disrupting that service and you're lifting the service. As you, as you put a solid tine into a green, that service has to go somewhere and it lifts the service up a little bit. And so I think that's a little reason for concern. When you use a hollow tine, the level of the surface, I don't think moves, does not move or change as much. And I believe that roots remain in better condition afterwards. I might add that if you aerate using either tine, and not top dress to fill the holes with sand, as Dr. Rock pointed out, then your biomass will probably not decrease at all and holes will eventually fill up with nothing but roots and stolons over time and the biomass percentage actually remains unchanged or even increases. So as Dr. Rock pointed out, greens, when greens age, you can see what happens to the aeration porosity. After one year, it's it's really good. The aeration and water fill porosity is still good. After six years, uh, it's starting to get a little bit out of line. And after 19 years, uh, you've got problems, you know, typically. Algae, wet wheel, moss, LDS, disease, summer decline, aeration is gone and water, you know, you've got more moisture in your profile. And so, you know, Without good aeration and top dressing programs, your greens will age at a higher pace and greens construction could be needed sooner than later. So designing an aeration culture program, based on my years of experience, these are my primary objectives. I, I want to remove 20% or more service area per year. USGA guidelines says 15 to 20. I think minimum is 10. That's usually not enough. Uh, natural organic buildup is between 18 and 28 uh, percent, just without, you know, depending on your practices. Um, best plan is to take into account the hottest and most stressful time of the year for your climate. If your greens are not doing well in, in the worst times of the year, then you, you really probably need to consider doing more. Secondary objectives to this program is backfilling all the holes completely with the USGA tested sand, decompact soil, decreasing the bulk density, improving natural biomass decomposition through oxygenation of the soil, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I, I, I can, you can read everything else. Increase firmness, uh, gaining drier surface, decrease water retention, uh, improve rooting capabilities, improve shoot health and shoot density. So you get all of those naturally when you do this. So uh, let's talk a little bit about tines. It's, it's a, probably a big, a big important uh, item. Um, <clears throat> from the left to right are examples of a typical solid and coring tines you might find common in the market. I do utilize the six millimeter tine on the left. Uh, to help incorporate not only some sand top dressing, but wetting agents, fungicides, fertilizers, as well as insecticides, depending on the target I'm going after. Also, these help to re release toxic gases from the soil and improving oxygen levels to the root zones. Needle tines or venting tines 
which is commonly the buzzword with Dr. Rock pointed out, have seen an increase in use over the years as they do help percolation rates. And I believe the main reason is because of the smaller, the smaller the tine size, uh, the more you can increase the number of holes per square foot with little disruption to the surface. As the smaller the tine, the closer the spacing can become. And one important thing here and keep in mind is due to the size of the hole, incorporating top bristling sand into these small holes becomes much more difficult. So I use them for venting as, as everybody pretty much uses them for and uh, putting stuff, allowing to get materials and stuff into them and release gases and all that stuff. My, pref my preference in coring aeration would be the 12.2 above below the red arrow I just put up, um, which I feel is the best time in the industry for the following reasons. First, the size of this time, and I have to say this is the Toro, uh, time I give you the number later, but it's a it's a it's a it's um it's the the idea of this time is just big enough to allow top dressing sands to get into the hole without too much trouble if done when the sand is dry, which is critical. Second, the holes left behind are clean; they're not too large. They will recover much quicker than than a larger ID time. Third due to the configuration and the time and the time block, more holes per square foot means more thatch, biomass removal, and less recovery time in the process. Some people use a bayonet time for venting, and I find the disruption to be less than the, the larger time, and therefore recovers quicker. So that, that time is my number one go-to time. So times and time configuration spacing, more holes per square foot by using the correct time holder does make a difference, but use caution in the spacing. Times with a smaller than a four or five uh, inch ID create holes that are very difficult to fill with sand. I prefer to use a proven time that has a thin wall. That's what I like about this time. It has a very thin wall and thickness to ensure less disruption in the, on the surface. So you don't have any heaving or, or movement in the surface, minimizing damage to the roots. Tines with a hardened tip. And I don't know if anybody will be able to see this on the screen, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if you, if you notice up in the corner, and I can show you, I can show this full screen later, but this is a typical tine with a hardened uh, tip. Okay, there it is right there. It's a little better. It's, it's the thickness of this particular tine is very thick and I, it does leave more disruption uh, and that's why I don't like using it. The only advantage to that tine is they last longer and they're economical and a, a lot of golf courses are economic driven so I understand that but if you want to, to me, if you want to do the job then I think the tine is important. Um, I think um, there are there are hundreds of tines on the market today, but not all of them do the job as others, as I said. Um, I think the, the other tines that I don't like are the ones that are that typically plug up the ones that are hollow all the way to the surface and and uh, those are also I like this. This, the one that I'm talking about is a side eject. Um, this is the actual tine, the 648 Toro tine holder block that I use. It, you'll notice that it has one row of tines on it, not two. Even though it has two rows, you can put um, 10 tines per block. Um, and in some cases, I do that with the needle tines and the venting tines, but I don't do it with this particular time because at the very sm close spacing, it's, this is actually a little bit closer. Um, and I don't like driving two tines into the green at the same time because it, I've noticed that when I do that, it damages the green at a, at a higher pace. So I, I think that putting one row of tines in this holder works extremely well. You just got to set the, the air fires to the right speed 
and then you can achieve uh, the right spacing. So also a deep time machine, uh, I think maybe once per year is, is a is a good program to begin with if you don't if you're not doing this maybe a lot of a lot of guys will swear by this doing this maybe once a month depending on what you have and and that may be warranted um, but I think this is a, a very uh, clearly beneficial machine that help your overall program improving drainage down deep breaking through the the, the, the the aeration pan that you typically get if you go year after year with the same depth. So I, I, I totally recommend a deep tine of some kind to, to do this. Uh, this, is, this machine, I, I was using this at a 20 centimeter depth. That's about eight inches, eight to 10 inches. So here is the operation with that setup um, on, on the greens after uh, the deep tining has come through. You can see uh, in this slide a little bit of the holes already made by the, the deep time machine. Uh, and years ago, this machine was not available. Uh, you know, I guess that means I'm getting old. Um, but in my experience, the number one aerating machine in the world with the number of options that this machine can provide, it has the capacity to help you be successful more than ever. As you can see from the photo, there's a lot of material being brought to the surface behind this machine. In one aeration, with this setup, you can achieve over 10% removal in one aeration. The important thing that I wish to point out is in the core removal process. Some people typically want to get in a hurry and remove the cores as soon as possible with windrow attachments, manual plug pushers, scoop shovels, and everything in between that they have in order to get the job done as quickly because they don't have enough time. The organic matter can dry out, or let's just put it this way. Um, the, the important thing that I wish to point out is, is in the core, uh, I mean, if you, um, if you wait until the holes are dry, they won't seal off at the surface and the organic matter um, won't seal off the holes at the surface allowing you to get the sand in. So I feel like it's more efficient if you leave the cores on the surface until they're completely dry before you remove them. Um, this creates a much cleaner open hole at the surface in order to be able to make it easier to get the hole completely filled with the sand and amendments. This is because less organic matter bridging over the top of the hole will help keep, keep it cleaner, increasing the percentage of sand getting into each hole. This is a key point and does, does require extra time to complete the job. And this particular aeration, as you can see, nine to 10 centimeters depth. Now, this is that setup that I just showed you. This, this shows you eight, eight times you know, in, in one foot at 30.5 center centimeters, um, which is what you get with a tine holder with one row of tines, which is what I prefer. Depending on the forward movement, you can achieve 10% plus organic removal. And this is an example of that. Uh, here you can see uh, that tine that I used in this situation at, and we, we achieved at 88 holes per square foot if you can count, there's 11 holes in one foot. So we were achieving 88 holes with that spacing, um, which is pretty tight. This may or not be good for some of your greens, depending on the turf grass variety that you have. The spacing can easily be adjusted to fit at, on, the, on that machine. So, the, but the tighter the spacing, you know, the better, but I use caution. If you go too close, you could, you could have problems. And one other point, how often do you get a chance to be able to put amendments like gypsum, uh, axis, or, or certain materials into those holes, as well as sand and fertilizer, um, directly into the profile with the holes open? 
Uh, I find that this type of time size and spacing allows for more material to be placed where it will do the most good. I strongly advocate this approach over others due to the synergistic effects you can achieve with this setup. If you use a larger time and larger spacing, you may achieve the same biomass percentage. However, you will not receive all the benefits of being able to apply more product into the soil profile as you are with a, with a slightly smaller time size and shorter spacing. So this is, this, this time spacing is showing seven holes lateral at the same 30 and a half centimeters wide. So here you see a little different time holder producing seven holes lateral. And that produces, with this particular time on the left, it's a little bit bigger time. Um, and you get 56 holes per square foot um, instead of 88. Now with this tine and this tine holder, you can see a larger tine. Uh, and in this scenario, you nearly equal the total percentage of biomass removal due to the larger tine size. But as, as the previous scenario, however, I mentioned before, you don't get the total number of holes per square foot with this setup. If this is all you got equipment wise, then by all means, it's better than not doing any aeration at all. But in my opinion, it's not as good as the other setup because the holes are larger, takes longer to repair them. You're getting the same biomass removal, but uh, the other tines do grow in quicker. So that's why I prefer the smaller tine, which, which get, you gain almost the same biomass removal. Here is the one chart. I'm sure there's more out there you can calculate the, the affected area by yourself if you're a good mathematician. I just tend to like this chart because it just gives me the number instantly and it's very easy to read um, and it's real handy to anybody that wants it. I think it's a great tool to use to, to, to measure what you're doing. And here is, this is actually at, at Coto di Casa. I, I uh, do, was doing this this week, as I said. Uh, as you noticed within this one foot, I'm, I'm getting uh, eight holes instead of um, uh, the, the, the other one. I'm sorry, 10. I'm getting 10 holes. And so this is, this is 80 holes per square foot. As you can see by this chart that I took off that other page, I'm getting um, 80 holes per square foot at a half inch time, 12.2 millimeter ID, and you go over to the 10.91, and I'm, I'm affecting 10.91% surface area and 80 holes per square foot or 30.5 centimeters per square. And this is uh, eight days after that particular aeration with those tines at Coto di Casa, you can see uh, very little disruption after eight days. And I know maybe some of you are thinking, wow, eight days, that's a, that's a long time. And it is, but, but like I said earlier, um, it's important. I think it's important to, 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 to have this kind of program. Um, so that's why I use it. Uh, and this was taken just two days ago because I'm right in the middle of aeration right now. And if, it, it's also, uh, I think, important that you have heard the saying, what gets measured gets done. Probably just last week with Speaker Michael Brainwood. Um, therefore, I believe that if you stay on top of your programs and you measure your results, it will help you understand the effectiveness of the equipment and program that you're using. As you can see by this chart, um, I did achieve approximately 22% service area removal for a complete four year period consistently. I think it's important to document the dates and the other data to be able to look back and evaluate your program at a later date. Can everybody see, I think that the bottom 22% showing 22% down there, that's why I put it up here. So uh, this, this is the four year history from 2015 to 2018 at, at, at Shanking Bay. So um, 
Let's talk about top dressing sand. The appropriate top dressing sand is a critical component, as Dr. Rock said, helping to control thatch and the most important item to reduce thatch buildup. Using the correct top dressing sand is just as important as the sand itself. Incorrect physical size sands can cause serious long-term issues. Dilutes organic material on the surface, as Dr. Rook said. Dilution is of the pollution. Um, it helps improve surface drainage, helps to add oxygen and water into the soil, helps resist, restrict any algae growth on the surface, and heavier rates are used during aeration, lighter frequent rates throughout the season. Uh, light top dressings helps reduce that. So here, um, I'm going to back up. I don't know if I can back up previous. Um, as, as Dr. Rock pointed out, uh, the particle size of the sand can offer and often change due to logistics, sand availability, and cost implications. My recommendation is to find a sand that meets the USGA specs and is readily available and stick with it over time to keep layering and loss of water infiltration due to, due to using different sand top dressing mixes. As a golf course superintendent, being able to, to do consistent light top dressings can be a challenge to many clubs. Each time you do a light top dressing, you're applying a sandpaper-like substance, as I said earlier, to your greens, and that will completely destroy the sharpness of your mowers after just a few passes. As Dr. Rock pointed out, many superintendents have selected a finer sand in the result of hoping to be able to work the sand into the canopy. Using diff different techniques to work the sand in is always the biggest challenge. I believe that very little sand is actually able to penetrate the ultra dwarfs and the top bent grass canopies of today due to these tight cultivars. Therefore, it is even more important that during aeration, the job gets done as best that you can achieve. So this is back to that Tennessee University of Tennessee that study on strictly top dressing. And as you can see, top dressing at six times per year resulted in the, the least uh, thickness of thatch from a millimeter 6.18 versus 7.99. So that is a lot of reduction for a lot of sand. So uh, sand as Dr. Rook and I, and I can confirm is absolutely critical. So how do we get the sand? And Dr. Rook had the same slide. This is just another slide that, that shows the actual USDA recommendations for, for top dressing and, and, and actual construction of a green. And I know he po pointed out that the people want to consistently use the same type of sand that the greens were built out of. And that's why this is the Bible kind of uh, on, on selecting sand. Um, I don't think there's a better guideline out there uh, finding a better top dressing sand than this one in the world. And this is what I, I've been using for years. I base all my physical analysis on this chart. And this is how I do it. Uh, I have a complete set of, of screens uh, from top to bottom that, that, that will se separate into that USGA sand fraction. Um, I recommend utilizing these particular screens. There's a 10, 18, 35, 60, 100, 120, and a pan. Um, I recommend using this on, on site uh, for proper use. Uh, it, it's, it's impossible to determine whether a sand meets the USGA specification without a simple test. Over the years, these screens will give you the confidence you need to negotiate with sand suppliers towards the purchase of, of the correct sand for your greens. It's not always convenient to send a sand sample to the lab for testing, and that takes time. However, if that's all you can do, then I highly recommend sending it to the lab. Uh, but I think these sands, I carry them around everywhere I go, and I use them, and they work. But 
in, in conjunction with these screens, you gotta also have two other things. Number one, this particular uh, triple beam balance that I weigh out my samples with is very accurate. Um, it's, 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 it's great. You can set this up and test the sand, weigh it out. And then this machine, this little oven, you can see I've got two samples in there being, being done. Um, I, I will take a, a, a good sample and I'll, I'll remove all the moisture so, uh, uh, and then I'll let it cool off. A dry sand will go through the screens without any problem. And like I've said in other talks before, this method isn't 100%, it's plus or minus one or 2%, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, here you see some tests that I have done. Uh, the three circle, or uh, what I have at Kodo, but there's four USG top dressing sands, all slightly different, but well within USG specs. The one with the green arrow right there is showing 84.4% coarse sand, ever so slightly coarser. This is my current top dressing sand of choice to use during aeration, which is slightly more beneficial to fill the holes with versus the other two on either side. Uh, due to the slightly more coarse sand. As Dr. Rock pointed out, this has been a trend for a number of years using a slightly coarser sand during aeration uh, to negate the finer sand top dressings used other times of the year, which I confirm. According to a study that he pointed out by Rutgers University, by Dr. Rock, only when you use a very fine sand that you will tend to have issues with excess moisture retention on the surface. And so I prefer to stick with a, a good sand and also do a light verticutting in conjunction with a light top dressing, as I pointed out, which improves the sand incorporation into the mat layer and keeps my profile consistent over the years. So here is, um, Laying sand down as smooth as you can possibly do it with, with a belt driven uh, top dresser. Uh, and it's putting down a very even coat of sand. It's one of the best machines I've ever used uh, due, to, due to the solid drive roller that plays a part uh, in, in keeping tire tracks from, uh, um, you know, occurring in the on the green so I think this is this is great and then this is that particular top dresser as you can see the sand um, machine has a solid drive roller and set of wheels in the back and I love this particular uh, machine because of that it, it 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 actually helps you roll the greens at the same time you're top dressing them so any kind of tire tracks that you've had uh, this machine will kind of help you remove them quickly. So I love this machine. This machine here is what I'm currently using at Koto de Casa to fill the holes with. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit bigger. Um, but I'm, as you can see, I'm laying down a lot of sand to fill the holes. The important thing to, to get here is use what you have to get the sand down any way possible, even if you have to do it by hand. The important thing is don't skip the sand because you don't have the right equipment. That's, that to me is, is problematic. So uh, I'm use, utilizing this machine and it's uh, working good. Um, so, This is one way. What's the best method for incorporating the sand into the holes? Is it brush, chain mat, poco mat? I don't know. I mean, I've used uh, all the different drags, push brooms, every type of broom, rotating brushes, 
uh, cocoa mats, homemade mats, uh, chain mats. Um, this particular mat, in my opinion, um, I mean, they all do the job of putting sand into the holes. And I realize this may be, you know, superintendents have developed their way and their preferences, and that's fine. Um, the one I want to I want to point out a few things with this particular situation. Um, a few years ago, equipment I think if equipment manufacturing companies, you know, they they saw an opportunity, and a lot of superintendents wanted something better. They thought there was something better. That, you know, it's kind of uh, the old school, and maybe I'm maybe I am just old school. But anyway, using a rotating brush to move sand on the surface seemed to be a better idea and I think the trend was created and it grew. I think this trend continues today with lots of rotating brushes um, that, that help people move sand around the greens. Um, I think marketing is a good part of that and I think these brushes are here to stay and they're quite common in the industry but um, a few years ago these brushes didn't even exist um, and the chain mat, of, the chain mat that, that you see here was the tool of choice and the gold standard and everybody used them. I think a brush, in, 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 in understanding the brush, a brush does just what you would think. It brushes the sand along the surface, leaving small individual depressions over each aeration hole. Brushing removes the sand from the top of the, of the hole, leaving the small indentation later, which will require a follow-up top dressing. If removing sand from the surface is your goal, then this type of brush does the job. If you want a smoother surface and all your holes fill with sand, then I think the chain mat is a better choice. I've used this method on Bermuda grass, bent grass. I use it on my poa, poa greens, past palum, and others, always leaving the surface smooth. And if used correctly, does not damage the turf grass in, you know, with people, what some people believe. You know, you have to turn on the water as soon as you finish it, if it's hot, things like that. But I'd like to point out that the amount of, and the amount of sand that I typically put is pretty thick. And then and the need for something that can move the sand around the green and handle a larger amount of sand, um, this machine, this, this drag mat works versus a cocoa mat or other things. So enough on, the, on that. So just the final, most effective in getting sand into the holes and it's inexpensive, it's very lightweight, can use it, uh, causes less disruption, camp compaction. It leaves the entire surface smooth, uh, minimizes grain by working sand into the soil, into the profile surface. If properly used, will complete the task quicker with less compaction and mechanical injury, in my opinion. Um, this is, is what I also use to incorporate because I do feel strongly about getting the sand into the hole. And so I use a vibrating roller uh, after top dressing and dragging to open up and get as much sand into the holes as possible. You can't see it here, but that's a vibrating triplex roller. And, and I move that across the green very slowly and you can, you can see all holes open right up after uh, that machine passes over the surface. And, you know, you got to make sure that you're doing it when the sand is completely dry. Uh, that's the key. I think this is an overlooked, commonly overlooked practice that some people miss out that I think they're missing, but it does take more time. Okay, let's get into some fertility management. Um, Greens grade products should be easy to apply, small SGN, low burn potential, light and frequent applications, avoiding too much in at any one time will help reduce thatch and manage it. Foliar spoon feeding with university tested products is highly recommended. Uh, soil testing is a basic fundamental for macronutrient applications. Uh, a low pH, as Dr. Rock pointed out, will slow down microbial doc decomposition. Uh, and uh, so be careful with that. Uh, I do like organic fertile fertility because you're, you're basically 
managing a sand-based green and, and a little organic material. Henry's listening, but I had this on, this on the slide. I love Sustain 5210. It has iron. It's one of the best. Uh, I do, do strongly recommend that um, you, you utilize it and, and when the holes are open before you top press. Uh, a lower in rate synthetic blends I prefer uh, are a low nitrogen 5210, a 408, or maybe a 9018, depending on what you can come up with. Uh, I do use gypsum during aeration program to enhance the fertility program. I think it's a valid uh, thing. I've never found a golf course that, that didn't benefit from gypsum. Uh, I rotate my products and especially potassium applications in a sand-based green and microbes. Uh, the creation of thatch is definitely enhanced by over fertilization. The more aggressive your growth rate is, the faster thatch can develop. To ensure a consistent growth rate, foliar application of nutrients is a key component to thatch management overall. Spoon feeding with university tested foliar products, as I said, best at an ultra low rate on a weekly schedule has proven to be an extremely healthy way to manage turf grass. To ensure that growth rates are consistent, uh, clipping yields are becoming an excellent way to track when and how much fertility you apply each month. As pointed out by Dr. Rock, Dr. Micah Woods has an excellent protocol for those of you who want to record your clipping yields. Uh, one key to success here is consistent feeding of the plant that results in a clipping rate that is basically unchanged each week. A large application of nitrogen at any one time has implications that typically leave behind problems that will have to be addressed in other ways later. A slightly leaner, healthier stand of turf grass is much more prone to quality, thatch reducing cultural practices like verticutting and top dressing between aerations, helping to keep thatch in check and improving quality at the same time. You typically don't go perform mechanical cultural practices on your greens if you have unhealthy turf conditions and thatch management will just go right out the window. So it's really important to have a healthy turf so that you can continue to top dress, verticut, and do the things that you need to do to re reduce thatch. And accurate application methods for even distribution. Um, I, I had some stuff on that, but I left it out um, for later. But accurate application of materials is important. Good good sprayers, good, good fertilizer spreaders, good methods, um, and stuff like that. So let's, let's talk, talk a little bit about mowing and thatch management. Mowing frequency is dependent on the growth rate, as we said, clipping yields, uh, desired height, it, it uh, dependent on the growth rate desired at, of height of the turf grass. Green should be mowed so that no more than a third of the leaf blade is removed from single cutting, everybody knows that. Uh, Turf clippings do not contribute to thatch uh, as well on a green where a third rule is followed. Turf grasses leaves are minor contributors to thatch because they are composed of 75 to 80 percent water and have little lignin. So a lot of you know you feel like removing the clippings is, is key, but it's not that vital to thatch management. Lignin makes up a portion of the plant cell walls and is resistant to decomposition, as I said earlier. Rhizomes, stolons, and roots are the greater contribu contributors to thatch because they are made up of larger amounts of lignin. So let's get into irrigation management. Um, today's fast-paced world, clear, concise facts and accurate data are becoming more and more important, if not mandatory. There is the old school superintendent who says he knows his greens well and can predict when irrigation is required. Back in those days, those new tools did not exist and the old way was an art form. I used to be that guy, but now I've changed to this new technology of today for several reasons. 
First, the new technology is state-of-the-art and capable of providing data that we could only guess on before. Since water management is one of the most important items that a superintendent has to do every single day, it is knowing when, how much, and how often irrigation should be applied. I can't see what the real percentage of moisture is below the surface, but with this aid uh, and new device, I can make a much more educated decision improving on a critical input of irrigation being applied to your turf. Let me say that a leaner, drier turf, as I've said before, performs better than an over-irrigated turf. As you've seen previously with black layer, overwatering can be the sole reason for black layer and other issues if not managed appropriately. Moisture meters are often the difference between good and great greens. I can't stress enough how important irrigation management is to the overall turf health and ultimately thatch management. So applying too much irrigation water inhibits microbial decomposition by flooding the root zone and disrupting oxygen supplied to microbes need, that, that microbes need to, to thrive. A better managed drier root zone helps with disease management by requiring less overall fungicide active ingredient, helping the, your microbial community thrive. A healthier turf with stronger root systems will allow for increased verticutting and sand top dressing materials to be applied on a more consistent basis, as I said. So talk a little bit about water quality management. Um, these are some meters that I have used in the past. The TDS meter here uh, to, to tell me what my salts are and total dissolved solids. pH meter uh, for checking pH on a regular basis and these pH strips. Uh, very easy to get and very easy to use and very accurate. Uh, a hardness test kit for bicarbonates and hardness materials. Uh, another really good uh, uh, kit. And if, if anybody has any questions, I can, I can help you get these. Uh, okay, so wetting agents and thatch control. Uh, as back to the University of Tennessee study, uh, the, as you can see by um, this, this particular slide, the wetting agent was the least influential to thatch management out of every other treatment. So wetting agents don't change thatch one bit, and I'm sure Dr. Rock uh, confirms that, but um, um, it's still part of the overall health of the turf, which is a, a byproduct of good thatch management. So it's still important. And uh, I'm gonna go a little bit off track by, by, by kind of endorsing this, even though I'm not being paid for any of this, but Revolution, I've used it, it's a great product. If you don't have something as good as this, I highly recommend it. It's a great wetting agent. It does a super, a super job. And I've got, just for those of you, I'm gonna run through these. There's a lot of benefits that Revolution uh, does provide. Um, I can leave this you know, up for a second, but uh, it's, it's uh, I'm not gonna read these. It's just a really uh, excellent product. Uh, and, and this is an example um, of prior to a, a wetting agent. I'm gonna show, show this to you. Okay. Okay, here is, if it, on this, this slide, you can see the water is, is beating up. It's not really going in. It's, it's got a, a convex or, or a, a, a oval shape on the surface. The water doesn't seem to be wanting to go in, okay? And it's running down down uh, the green. So it's showing a hydro, hydrophobic surface. And now, uh, okay, we'll go to the next one. Here is that same green right after that wetting agent is applied. You notice that it's, the water is going straight in. It's a rounded shape and there's absolutely no hydrophobic and it goes right into the soil. So 
that's what a wetting agent will do to help you improve your water management. I think it's critical. So enough on that. Now, one quick last thing, uh, plant growth regulation. Uh, everybody knows Primo. Uh, the use of Primo in today's greens management programs is, is very common practice and is usually a key component to high quality putting greens. Greatest benefit in, is in the reduction of clippings if you're managing clippings. Primo mostly affects shoot growth. That's reduction from Primo applications is usually not a consideration for its use. In some cases, an increase in thatch could be realized. Uh, what you typically don't see below the soil is an increase in root structure and a healthier plant due to more resources being allocated below the surface. So I'm gonna just summarize what I've said. Uh, using core aeration is the most widely used aeration practice in which to control thatch when you also combine verticutting and top dressing all together. I confirmed 15 and 20% annual surface area removal is the best management practice. Uh, needle tines, venting tines, I, I confirm are the tine of choice used in between core aerations and do help incorporate more top dressing. Solid tines do help with controlling thatch, similar to coring tines, as Dr. Rock said, when top dressing is included. However, need to consider other factors and techniques. Uh, different techniques are required for this particular type of, you know, like Dr. Rock said, a lot of guys put their sand down first and then they drag the sand into the holes, which, you know, is a very good practice. The incorporation of a tested USGA sand is the most critical component to managing thatch and greens quality. Fertility management is also key to plant health and a good foliar program are, all, are essential best management practices. Water and irrigation management is critical to healthy roots and disease prevention, improving microbial populations and optimal soil moisture. Wetting agents and plant growth regulation for increased health benefits and improvements, however, reducing thatch should not be the key reason to apply these products. Evaluate your program annually for improvements. And with that, I'm over my hour. <laughs> not a problem, Roger. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I think one of the disadvantages of not traveling is not only do we get to have a, a a drink and a meal with you is that you don't have less time for the one-on-one -on -one questions that you normally get and you're usually uh, inundated with people after your presentations but we'll do our best uh, today and we have um, I don't know if you can see them on the screen on the Q&A but I can uh, I can read them for you we have quite um, a few yes All right. from Anit in uh, India He's asking um, regarding groomer versus verticutting. Are you suggesting that we should avoid buying groomers with green mowers or just buying verticutting reels? Actually, I I, I do I do avoid I, I would avoid groomers. Uh, I would not put groomers on my mowers. I wouldn't. I would use a verticutter instead. But see, that's that's typically some of the problems is some people don't have the money for a verticutter. I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, but if you're going to, if, if I'm going to be able to get the equipment that I want, I'm going to get a verticutter hands down separately from groomers. And I'm not going to put groomers on because they, they typically break. They typically don't uh, always work. And, and sometimes they run when you don't want them to run. I found a lot of problems with the groomers. Uh, and that's, and that's maybe, you know, the mechanics and the people doing setup and all that stuff, but I still think that uh, I would I would not put groomers on unless you have maybe I don't know I mean it, I, I I have heard that groomers sometimes help with seed head suppression with pole greens okay uh, you just barely tickle the surface to try to try to knock those seed heads out stuff like that I mean. You may have a good bona fide reason for groomers, and if you do, 
And if, and if people have found good results, and I'm not saying typically don't, but in a warm season uh, environment, I, I would rather use a verticutter than a groomer. Thanks, Roger. Uh, from Henry, uh, in uh, calling in from uh, Kuching, um, does increase of microbial population through humic form of fertilizers along with sound cultural practice help in, re in the reduction of biomass? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on the limb. I'm not a, I'm not a professor like Dr. Rock. I don't have any, you know, perfect uh, test data to prove any of that. I, I, it would be, I, I, you know, I think Dr. Rock and most most professionals would agree that that without a good microbial population, you stand no chance of of reducing your population naturally. So that's why I believe that it's a, a sound practice to help the population, especially in the sand-based green. So um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say yes, it, a, a, a humic acid form does have an impact. What that percentage is, I don't have an answer for that, but I, I, I firmly believe that it is valuable a commodity and if I'm going to have a perfect program, I'm going to I'm going to try to mix uh, as many things as I can to help that situation. If I've got a if I've got a thatch issue, then I'm going to definitely want to use it uh, in my program. Thanks. We have another question from Anit in India. Uh, what is your advice to the superintendents of golf courses where golf greens experience well they where they're experiencing almost 80,000 to 100,000 rounds a year. Uh, do they have to follow a more rigorous cultural practices compared to the recommended? Well, with, with that kind of rounds, mm. um, you know, you guys, or if you've got that kind of rounds, then this type of aeration um, is almost imperative because, you know, if you're not if you're not uh, doing that 20% that I recommended and you've got that many rounds, I don't know what kind of quality your greens are. And I know it's gonna be um, really difficult to, to, to sell that program, my program with that many rounds. And this is, this is what, I, what I said earlier about, about selling your program, but you might, you might go in and you might say, let's try it once and see what the benefits are. If, it, if we have to take an extra two or three days to do this program, let's, let's just see what it does, you know, and, and then evaluate it for yourself uh, and see what happens. But um, I, I do think that if you've got that many rounds, you've got a lot of compaction out there you got, you got issues, I think you really need this type of variation. Another question from Anit is uh, in a picture of the drag mat, is it okay to use a golf cart on the green surface? Generally, we use bunker rakes, rakes to drag the mat. Um, good question. Very good question. All, all good questions. And, and let me comment. I do use a golf cart in that picture, that was China. I, I should have taken a, I, I should have put in a video of, of me dragging my greens in Ed Cotto in California because I use a golf cart for two reasons. Number one, it's light and very, and, and number two, it has a very good turning radius and I can drag uh, a green very, e much easier than most, most utility vehicles are bigger and heavier and I absolutely advocate using a golf cart, which you saw in that picture, uh, that, that video, where we were using a golf cart in that scenario. So I highly recommend a golf cart with smooth tires. If you use a Sand Pro or any other machine and you have knobby tires or anything other than smooth tires, you're gonna have problems or you're, gonna, you're not gonna do as good a job than you would with a, a light machine that has smooth tires. I think the key is smooth tires and a light machine. Absolutely. Fantastic. We have a question from Ross in Hong Kong. Uh, Roger, 
Do you feel these days that with supers and course managers striving for greener looking greens that perhaps more nitrogen is applied than needed, which results in the need for additional thatch organic management practices? If you're putting more nitrogen down strictly for color, then you need to come talk to me. Uh, I think you need to incorporate a whole lot more iron uh, in, your, in, your, in your mix. You need, to, you, need to, you need to maybe look at some manganese, magnesium, uh, all the macronutrients. But um, what I do is I, I strictly go with a very small amount of nitrogen, but my, nit my, my iron content is very high. And I'll share something with you guys. I, I'm buying a product that's very expensive. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's available in China. It's called SGW. It's a, it's a pure iron product. And it is absolutely one of the best iron. It's a granular, but it, it's, it's a little bit problematic to apply. I'm sure you can get foliar products. You can mix up uh, fair sulfate in small amounts, but um, there's no question that if you're putting nitrogen down at a, at a higher pace just for color, then you're building thatch even higher at a higher rate than, than, than a lot of people are. And I would, I would strictly, I would really look at your fertility program and, and uh, tweak it some to try to add more iron for color versus nitrogen because, because you know, if you're just doing strictly nitrogen and you're pushing the plant for color, then you're gonna definitely have to, have to do more cultural practices and top dressing and maybe even aeration to combat that, definitely. I have a more of a comment uh, from Pat Julius in, uh, in Indonesia. He says, I agree with what Roger said. If all superintendents can follow up on these programs, we'll have uh, good quality greens. I mean, Pat Julius was uh, shared a lot of his expertise in Malaysia with us a while back, but uh, he's endorsing your methods. And I know you met Pat Julius when you're in Indonesia. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, a question from Nikhil in uh, India. Um, due to the pandemic, our aerification, uh, core aerification got delayed by six months. How best to manage the developing black layer using wetted agents and Primo or going into fall, any increase in gypsum apps or shall we apply next spring? Don't wait, don't wait for the, I mean, I would, I would apply the gypsum as soon as possible, even if you don't get it in the aeration holes. I apply gypsum in between aerations uh, at a smaller rate. And I think it's important, important. that's, that's my opinion. Uh, uh, I think it does help your fertility. And if you can do, do, do some venting, okay? And I know that you can't maybe core aerify, but like I said, if you can't core aerify, I recommend, highly recommend that you either use a bayonet time or a, that, that, that six millimeter time, maybe a lot more often than you normally would to try to eliminate that, that black layer because you, what you've got to do is get oxygen down into that root zone. That's number one. And using uh, wetting agents without a doubt to try to minimize the amount of water Primo, absolutely yes. As you got to do all the things to, to minimize black layer, and that is reduce and manage your water. That's that's key. Uh, and you, and wetting agents are part of that program. Uh, venting uh, and top dressing to try to try to help with with percolation and water infiltration. I mean, everything that I mentioned uh, is very important. And if you didn't airify because of pandemic, then you, you need to sit down and discuss, you know, when you can do that as quickly as possible. And because you didn't do it for six months, instead of doing it maybe a conventional way with, with a larger spacing and a smaller time, then maybe this is a good opportunity for you superintendents to say, look, this isn't normal for the club. We need to do a little bit more than we have in the past. And I would recommend um, selling this kind of program to your clubs and your managers and general managers because of that one fact that you've been delayed. Uh, otherwise, you, 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 what I would do is I would hold them responsible and say, if you don't let, allow me to do this, then 
then that relieves me of the responsibility that these greens are going to have problems in the future. Thanks. I have a, a, a question from Julius, Pak Julius again in Indonesia. It says, um, high salt water, is it correct that can, it can build up a black layer? High salt, salt water content. Well, let me say this. Because you've got a high salt content in your water, and I have, that, I have the same issue at Coto de Casa. I have very high salt water here, and I have to manage it. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's a couple of, key, couple of keys. Because, because you, you've got a high salt can, content water, what you're effectively having to do in some respects is add more water in order to, to satisfy the needs of the plant. You're adding more water because of the salt content because there's a higher osmotic pressure on the outside of the root structure. And so it, it requires a, a water content that's higher than normal which absolutely does cause black layer. So it's, it's, it's not the absolute cause, but it's definitely related to black layer. So you have to overwater in some, some instances because of high salt. So you're, you, you, you need to try to mitigate the salt as much as possible. And in order to do that, you've got to open up the greens. Uh, if they've got positive drainage throughout the, the, the profile, then you need to flush them. Uh, at, at some point down, you need to run, run a, a, a good quality water through the system as much as possible. Uh, the deep tining that I mentioned earlier is critical in helping that situation if you can do it. A lot of people don't have a deep tine, but you've got to figure out how to get that salt flushed out through the system. And, and using a deep tiner or something or, or, or just, just generally flushing with a good water source uh, is, is what you've got to do. So it is related. Thanks. Uh, I have another question. Uh, this is from Vincent uh, in, uh, in India. What's your advice on you, the use of sulfur burners for pH management? Um, I don't know what your water content pH is, but if you've got a very high pH, um, sulfur burners, burners ha I've been uh, known to do the job. Um, I'm not going to say they won't. Um, I, there, there, there used to be a sulfur, sulfur burner at the club that I currently are, am at, but it's no longer in use. I have discovered that through other means and other things. Uh, typically, um, a lot of clubs will, will pull the trigger on something drastic like a sulfur burner when I think they could probably mitigate the problem in other ways. I think if, if, you, if you do your research, uh, I think you can probably find a almost as good of a, a method to mitigate your pH problem by doing something else versus a sulfur burner because a sulfur burner requires an injection system and that can be problematic. I know people that have, that have basically had problems with the equipment and they fry their greens with, with too much sulfuric acid and this this can be problematic and so I, I would challenge you to look at it very carefully and try to mitigate you know your high pH um, in other ways versus I'm not saying that it won't work but if you've got a very good uh, system and, and it can be installed correctly and and then and then maintain accurately, then by all means, I think it's worth doing. But, you know, I, I would evaluate it very carefully. I have another question from Mahariono, I believe in Indonesia, about, about TDS meter. How many PPM standard for Tipton 328? Well, your tip, tip door for, yeah, or well, TIF 328, yeah. That's very, yeah, correct. Um, you know, Bermuda grass is, is very tolerant of, of uh, bicarbonates, but um, I don't know what the exact number of tolerance for, right off the top of my head, but it's, it's it'd be several hundred, uh, but I, I, I would say that if, you know, I would do, 
I would get that hardness test kit that I showed on the screen that from, from that company, or if you can find one in your country, uh, try to find out what the level of hardness is. And that here again, you can, you can mitigate a water hardness um, through other means also. I mean, but um, I, can't, I, I can't really answer specifically what the tolerance of, of 328 would be, but it, I know it's pretty high. If you're having trouble with, with your TDS and, and it sounds like you could have salt, you could have other problems, um, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> I guess that's a, there's a follow-up from Mariano. Is, is there data for TDS meters for several turfs? Is there any sort of standards? I, I could look that up for you and, and pass it on to you. I'd be happy to um, and, and help you with that. Yeah, we'll be CCing you on a follow-up communication with Roger if you're okay, you know, with uh, people to be able to contact you directly. That would be great because there's a lot of interest. Yeah, no problem. Okay. I think, you know, as usual with, with you, Roger, we have a lot of questions. I think we run the course and, and it's about perfect timing. I'd like to just thank you once again, you know, for sharing your expertise. And we hope to see you out here again sometime. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for all the participants. Great questions. Uh, hope, I hope I helped uh, help you all out. Good to see you uh, healthy and well. Um, I'm just going to follow up a little bit. I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedule to join us. Just to let you know, as we continue on with our seminars, just a little reminder, next Thursday, we have Jack Chung, uh, golf course superintendent from uh, Royal Salanger Golf Club. Many of you uh, know him. He'll be talking about attaining a suitable green speed for your facility and members and guests. The week after that on October 15th, also a Thursday, we'll have Eric Rule, certified club manager, general manager of Hazeltine National Golf Club. Um, and he'll be talking about nickels and dimes, more on the uh, club management side. And uh, then on October 22nd, uh, Thursday as well, we'll have Dr. Thomas Nikolai, uh, Senior Turf Grass Academic Specialist, Dep Department of Plant and Soil Microbial Sciences from Michigan State, very well known, the doctor of Greenspeed, and he'll be talking about the ABCs of putting green maintenance. So. Um, it's great to have Roger on and we have a, a firm lineup of professionals to continue. Um, so keep your schedule open. So once again, thank you so much. Um, and uh, to all of you out there, have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Thank you very much. Take care, Roger. Thank you.